trying to bring a speaker, okay? And it's always held at night, 6 to 8 p.m. on a Friday. Ideally, this one should have been on a Friday, but Tommy Ko can't make it, okay? So we held it on Thursday this time, but every time it's a Friday. And then two weeks from now, there'll be the, the other, the, the, the ordinary seminars will start, okay? We invite members of the public, so if you are on our mailing list, on our database, you will get an invitation. Right, to attend these seminars, they, and we also approach people to give these seminars because it's our chance also at public education. So on the one hand, we educate our students in the different dimensions of the environment, and we also use this opportunity to inform members of the public. Okay, so this is the inaugural seminar that sets up the series of seminars. So over to you, Tony Okosa. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, I will not give a lecture, I will just tell you stories. First, I will tell you a story of, um, I'll tell you, uh, okay, I'll tell you a story of uh, paintings on cave walls. Then I will tell you a story about insights I've gained over the last 30 years of doing battle. And tell you stories also, more important, of what is it that we can do? I mean, we are overwhelmed by so many problems, but what is it that we can do? First, I'll let me tell you the story of paintings of cave walls. Once upon a time, in a faraway land, there was a group of islands so rich and so beautiful. It was called the Perla del Mar, the Oriente, Pearl of the Orient Sea. The land and the sea were teeming with life, clean rivers, clean air. Everybody was happy. Money, they hardly had any, but they had the only currency was friends and family. So they worked only an hour a day and spent the rest of the day at play. So they were very happy. One day, men from foreign lands came and started cutting down their trees, started fishing out all their seas, started taking out all the corals. Tao look mean that man. <laughs> and then they told the natives, and then they dug out the soil for a few shiny pieces of metal. And then they told the natives, that is what happiness is all about. That is what progress is all about. So one man, seeing all of this, they could not eat, they could not uh, drink the water anymore, the air was dirty, and all for the name of progress. And so one man was so disheartened, he said, you know, I cannot take this. I'll go up the mountain. He went to live in a, in a forest. He went to live in a, found a cave. And then he saw the cave and then he said, oh, I live there. And then there he lived until the rest of his life. Became a hermit. Many years later, children went up the mountain, went camping, and they saw the cave. When they saw the cave, they saw on the left side of the cave, there were beautiful paintings depicting how beautiful his country was. And on the inner side of the cave, there were paintings about ugly the world had become, all in the name pursuit of happiness and pursuit of progress. And on the right side of the cave, there were <coughs> outlines and unfinished sketches. What are those? My friends, perhaps on the left side of the cave, it showed what was. Inner side, it showed what is. And on the right side, it showed what will be. What is it going to be? I do not know. Nobody knows, but I only know two things. One is that if the future is anything like it is today, it's not going to be pretty. We're looking at a window of 20 to 30 years. Number two is that we cannot paint the future using the same old worn out paint brushes that we used to paint the past. For human beings, thoughts, and action, thoughts are our, uh, words are our paint brushes. Action is our medium, and the earth is the canvas of our art. So what are, what are these words? First, environment. What is the environment? Sir, what's your name? Isaac, what is the environment, sir? Please stand up. You know, sitting is the new smoking. You should not sit for more than two hours a day. <laughs> environment.
Yes, very good. Lady in green, are you going to be a student here? Okay, please rise. Shared environment, what is the environment? What do you mean by the word environment? Do you understand by the word environment? Shared asset. See, if I ask, we have 50 people here, the meaning of the word environment, they will have at least 50 different answers. Why? Because environment is difficult to understand. In the first place, it is not our language. It is not even English. Those of you who speak French know it is a French word, difficult to pronounce. So it does not resonate in our mind, and neither does it touch our heart. When you say Edwin is an environmentalist, or Lin Heng or Ko uh, Yen are environmentalists, people look at them as if they were hippies. <laughs> so Tony is an environmentalist, and he had three hugger. What is the environment? Is it about the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees? Or is it about the sources of life, of land, air, and water? Easy to remember, the law of life. You take out anyone or you poison any of the L, the A, or the W, there is no life. To make it even more understandable, let's compare it to the human body, where the trees and the forest are the heart and the lungs of the earth. Where the land and the soil is the skin and the flesh of the earth, from whence we get all our food. And where the sea and the rivers are the blood and the blood streams of life. 70% of the human body and 70% of the earth is made up of salty water. Once we understand that, we stop talking about the environment as if it were something out in the moon. Do you want to drink poison water? No. Who wants to drink poison water? No one. So everybody is an environmentalist after all. You tell that to, uh, you tell that to the president of somewhere. <laughs> I will not tell you what. <laughs> okay, another word. My friends, if that is the only thing that you remember today, we shall have done our share. It is the law of life. The land, air, and water that makes life possible. Development. Another difficult word. Development. You know, when you have more syllables than two, it's very difficult to understand. I do not understand what it is. But I will tell you a story instead. You know this gentleman, Chirat? No? Sir, you know, I'm picking on you. You may pick it. You know this gentleman? Yeah, I probably don't know him because he's my grandfather. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he, um, I grew up with him, he was a rich man, he died at the age of 82 years old, and then one day after we buried him, his lawyer called me, Tony, come over to my office. I went to the office, he says, you know, you're the favorite of your grandfather. Your grandfather left you an inheritance. Oh, thank you, I was 23 years old, I was in second year law school. Oh, thank you very much. He says, okay. Here's the check for what would now be something in the order of $10 million. That's a lot of money for a 20-year-old. So, no, thank you very much. Post it the bank. The day after, I withdrew $2 million. I invited all my friends. We went to the casino. We gambled it all away. Finished. Second day, $2 million. Finished. Another day, until five days later, it was almost gone. And then he said, oh, as if that was not bad enough, what my grandfather saved for 82 years, I squandered in five days. And then I go to my accountant and say, hey, you list down all my losses, all my expenses, all the things that I've wasted, you list it down as income, as revenue. And then you make an auditor's note that I am making progress and this is called development. <laughs> is that okay? Of course it is not correct. Any accountant who will agree will, will be disbarred. Will be, uh, but my friends, isn't that what we're doing to the earth? The earth took four and a half billion years. No. How long does a human being live? We'll be lucky if we get to be 18. Four and a half billion years. And in the last 200 years, We've squandered it literally a minuscule, a microscopic fraction of time. We have squandered it all away. And 
then we call it contribution to growth to GDP. What is GDP? Yeah, great disaster for the planet. <laughs> <laughs> they did a study. I know that they did a study that if we copy the lifestyle of the so-called developed countries, I will not mention the developed country somewhere where the president comes from, <laughs> we will need nine Earths. So you're going to be another student here? Oh, you're already, a, you're already, you were the champion there, you and Virgil. How many Earths do we have? One. So we're now copying the wrong model of development. That, my friends, is what I call export economics. The economics of extraction and consumption. You extract as much as possible, as much as fast as much as possible from the earth, then you burn it, you, you throw it away, you, and then you call it GDP. This is a perfect example of GDP. Is that a road or a parking lot? <laughs> My friends, if XCON economic, XCON, by the way, also stands for, for those of us who are lawyers, it also stands for economic. It is the economic paradigm, the economic mindset that has resulted, that has been indicted, tried, and convicted, and sentenced for the crime of planetary plunder. So, that is development? I don't think so. That's... So what is the opposite of export economics? I call it CPR economics. The economics of conservation, protection, and restoration. To restore the land, air, and water that makes life possible. To restore our connection with nature. To restore our connection with each other. And most of all, to restore the common sense goal of life, which is not the pursuit of happiness. It is the experience of to be with friends, to be with family, to have a meaningful job. Oh, <laughs> the story of my grandfather, that's only a story. <laughs> it is said that the best stories are those which blend fact, fiction, and fantasy. <laughs> the fact is that he was really my grandfather. He was a merchant mariner. He was a harbor pilot. I would go with him. I grew up with him. I grew. I, that's how I learned my love for the sea. The fiction is that he was very rich. And the fantasy is that I inherited $10 million <laughs> and squandered it in five days. But my friends, is not that the kind of fantasy world we are living in? We take out everything from the earth, use it for not more than a few, few seconds. This is a perfect example. How long did it take for this plastic to become plastic? Where did this come from? Oil. How long did it take oil to become what the oil is? 200 million years. We drink it and we throw it away. And we call it contribution to gross domestic product. So I am not saying it is wrong. I am saying it is totally wrong. <laughs> so you shift the mindset from waste. We call it consumption. By the way, consumption, the word consumption has two synonyms. You look at it in the dictionary. The word consumption, synonym of the word consumption, is waste. So we are living with a, an economy that lives on waste. And the most wasteful are the so-called developed countries. You've been to America, you've been many places, and they throw away everything. They call themselves developed. I call them OC, over-consuming country. We, we are LC, the low consuming countries. They should copy us, not we copy them, because as the gentleman said, we only have one head. And we are going to bankrupt the earth by the way we live. So, what is that? Call them over consuming countries and call us low consuming countries. LC, OC also stands for obsessive compulsive. A psychological disorder that is characterized symptom, the symptoms of which is excessive control and excessive body. LC 
C also stands for loving and caring people. My friends, second portion is the insights I have gained. First, I am a battle-scarred veteran with too many wars, uh, corn and covered with scars. I have only learned three things. One, it's all a game. And it's all play. Two, we are not learning, we are not completing anything, we are only planting seeds. And after 35 years of practicing law, or doing, if you call it practicing, <laughs> or being, having, having fish and the air and the trees as my clients, the fish and the trees do not pay attorney's fees. Law is a marketing exercise. I will explain. First, it's all a game. You know, we say, we do battle with this, we battle with that, we fight this. No, stop fighting. It's all a game. When you are in fighting mode, you are tense, you're stressed, you're adversarial, you're not cooperative, and you're after the end goal, which is winning. I win, you lose. You win, I lose. It's a zero-sum game. But if you're in a spirit of play, you're not after the end goal, you are not stressed, you are relaxed, you're cooperative, you're happy, and you're not after the end goal. The end goal is winning not for anyone, but for all of us. So, my friends, we are too serious. <laughs> In our lives, we are too serious. I know you're going to work hard, you're going to study hard, but learn how to laugh. Learn how to enjoy yourself. In triumph and tragedy, it is all part of the comedy of life. And in victory and disaster, I only have one prescription, laughter. That is what happened to my book, Disaster. Um, and another point is that there is no limit to what we can achieve when we do not care who gets the credit. There is so much credit grabbing in this world. Uh, whatever field, whether in politics or in business, etc., etc. Number two, is that we are only planting seeds. There is a saying that says, anything that is worth doing cannot be done in one lifetime. So in this lifetime, we can only hope to plant seeds. Double I, plant seeds of ideas and plant seeds of history. My friends, many years ago, Lin Heng told you about the little case that I filed. I was a very young lawyer. I was about almost out of law school. But I saw, you know, the Philippines is one of the mega diversity countries in the world. As Virgil was saying, we live in a paradise. Is it who wrote Paradise Lost? Dante? Is it Dante? <laughs> well, we are the Philippines. We are the Galapagos multiplied ten times. You know the Galapagos Island? People go there just to look at the you know fish and whatever. But this is a page out of the book of the Museum of Natural History at the University of Chicago. We are the Galapagos Islands multiplied tenfold. Can you imagine how rich we are? But yet, look at what happened. Using the paradigm of extraction, the economic paradigm of extraction and consumption, look what happened. This is 1900, the forest cover. The Americans came in the 1900. And then, in 1988, look at what happened all in the name of GDP. <laughs> and then they call that economic progress. So I was a very young lawyer and I liked, you know, I, I just liked being in the mountain and being like in the forest, so that's why I... So I said, there were 800,000 hectares left of virgin forest in the Philippines. Government granted 4 million hectares to cut down all these trees. So in, in, in effect, government granted logging concessions, legal logging concessions, to four times, five times more than what was available. So does this add up? Of course it does not add up. You know, there was much debate, and I was a very young lawyer, I said, I, I go to the media, nobody will listen to me. Even if they listen to you, they give you 15 seconds. So he said, where is, I am not a lawyer, I am only a storyteller. Words are my paintbrushes. And law is my medium, and the canvas of my art is the court. Although I thought then, I said, I need to tell the story. Whether or not they listen, at least in the courtroom, I can present the evidence, I can organize the evidence, and they will have to listen because they will receive a summons. They will have to come and face me in court. Of course, it was dismissed right away. 
And I said, uh, you know, the offended party is not me. The offended party are my children, the eldest of which was three years old, and the children of the Philippines who are impeded in behalf of themselves and of future generations. I didn't know about intergenerational equity, but it's pure common sense. So, of course, I lost. <laughs> After one year, it was not even heard in the courtroom. It was just dismissed outright by the court. So I said, ugh. So I went to the Supreme Court. I didn't even know how to file an appeal in the Supreme Court. So the issue was whether or not they had personality to sue. So the court said, well, they have personality to sue based on the concept of intergenerational responsibility. I cannot even pronounce the term. And it said it was now specially mentioned in the fundamental law of the, of the uh, because the question was, it's not even in the Bill of Rights. That right that I said, the right to environment, healthy environment, is not even in the Bill of Rights. But the court said, can you read that, sir? If it is now specially mentioned. Fundamental law of the land is because unless it is written in the Constitution itself. Madam, can you read that? The day would not be too far. The day would not be too far when all else would be lost, not only for this generation, but also for succeeding generations. Generations which stand to inherit nothing but a parched earth, incapable of sustaining life. My friends, that was 25 years ago. I filed this case in 1990. I got the decision in 1993, that was almost 25 years ago. Uh, it has since resonated, nobody in the Philippines heard about that, but it has since resonated around. And it is prophetic. That decision of the court is prophetic. Then, what happened since? Well, the government cancelled all logging concessions in the virgin forest, shifted it to the secondary forest. So we still have the little patch of 800,000 hectares left. A little patch. And my intention was to cancel all logging in the Philippines. That happened one generation after, only three years ago. The president canceled stop all logging in the Philippines, in natural forest. So I'm still lucky. I'm lucky I'm still alive when I saw that. But um, I never expected that to happen in my lifetime. Now, next, our seeds. <coughs> These are seeds I planted. Look, we have the richest marine waters on earth. Pardon me for bragging, but even Chao Luk Min will agree with me that, look at this book, we are in the center of the center of marine biodiversity on earth. Look at this. See? Malaysia, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia. But the center of the center is the Philippines. And this is not a Filipino. Well, the sad thing is that it's not a Filipino talking. It's a, it's a, uh, uh, these are foreigners your friend, I'm sure you know, your friend uh, Ken Carpenter did studies. It has been uh, the apex of that. Look at this. The apex of the red part. This is the Visayan Sea. This is Manila Bay. The red part of that is the richest of the richest marine waters of Earth. That's Manila Bay. But what have we done to Manila Bay? We throw away 16 million gallons of raw and untreated sewage every day. 16 million liters on there, 4 million gallons. And we call it progress. We call it a necessary consequence of progress. So it was time in 1997, I did, 1996, I was so bored in the Philippines, fighting many wars. I went for a holiday and took my master's. Uh, pretended to take my master's, but I was really learning how to sail. But it was, when I came back, Instead of having a fancy degree, I decided to quit my law practice. And I decided to follow my heart. So I said another, I quit it September 8th. I gave all my letters to the clients. Thank you very much. I'm moving on. In January, three months later, four months later, I filed the case against the entire Philippine government to clean up Manila Bay. Of course, I never expected to win. But I expected to tell a story. It took 10 years. To tell that story. Finally, <laughs> all the way to the Supreme Court, I won. And they are now required to submit reports every three months. Is it clean now? I don't know. But I've done my share. And that's all I can ask for myself. It has a, this is the beautiful sunset of Manila Bay. Uh, there are now young functionaries in the Department of Interior, in the Department of the Ombudsman, etc., etc., that they're taking it on. See, you plant the seed. 
you never know if it lands on good soil, but sometimes somebody follows and takes care of that. Now it's about to happen. And then I also did a lot of direct enforcement action. Like instead of, you know, we have a problem with blast fishing, dynamite fishing. So I decided that instead of catching the small fry, I will go after the syndicates, meaning the syndicates that were selling blasting cups and blasting powder. So I organized raids. I'm just an ordinary citizen, but I organized raids. This was the largest in Philippine history. The largest death seizure. I was the one who organized that. It was not the police. They just accompanied me. One truck. Then this is another raid we conducted. And then we even sued public officials. And then what did that harvest? Oh, it harvested. It harvested this. This was my deputy, my buddy. We were threatened. There was a piece of news that said there was a one million reward bounty for anybody who could kill him or me. 48 hours later, come someone comes into his house and shoots him six times with a 45 caliber. Then I was the I was the main mastermind, so I was the main target. But maybe they could not find me. Not even my wife could find me. <laughs> but what has happened since last July 22? The governors of the Visayan Sea met, and number one, we now have a boat that will do education and research, and number two, they passed the resolution to declare the entire Visayan Sea an area of 1 million, 1.3 million hectares as a fish sanctuary. Maybe it's going to happen, maybe it's not, but it's moving on. And third, my friends, is marketing, law is a marketing exercise. Why marketing? Marketing sells a product. Law sells a mode of conduct. We have been trying to enforce the law, but enforcement is negative energy. It is coercive, it is prohibitive, it's negative energy. So I'm twisting that around to promote law or the spirit behind the law as a marketing exercise. It's social marketing, actually. Social marketing with the legal spirit. That is why Verdiel, we're having a hard time trying to comply because we're trying to, to uh, try to comply with simple solid waste management law. So we came up and I announced this last year. Uh, we were about Segar. We were about to uh, launch this. We launched. I launched a people's gratitude movement. I got government agencies, and I recently got my achievement for the last month was that I got the United Nations to support it to recognize. Somebody was saying. Uh, Tommy Cole was saying, all we hear of is bad news. And it gives us negative energy. So why can we not shine the spotlight of recognition with the 99.9% .9 of the things that good, of the good things that happen in this world? So it's time to do that. Media will never, because bad news, does, uh, good news does not sell. Media will not do that. Media is the plural of mediocre. <laughs> oh, what happens? Oh, there. Oh, there. So we launched this. We got the office of the ombudsman. By the way, the office of the ombudsman in the Philippines is the anti, the very powerful anti-graft and corrupt practices. And why is it a corrupt practice? Because not implementing the law is gross negligence in the performance of public duty. I just tweet that. I got the ombudsman to agree. So we launched this. It now has the stationery of the ombudsman. Uh, you know, when, you re when you're a public official in the Philippines, you get a letter from the ombudsman, you literally shake in your, you literally fall off your chair because you're going to be investigated, you're going to be uh, tried, prosecuted, published in the newspaper. But I said, what if we use the stationery, the power of the stationery, you get a letter, Dear Mr. Nelson Lowe, we write to congratulate you and thank you for the good work that you're doing. So imagine, we shift from the negative energy of enforcement to the happy energy of positive reinforcement. We multiply goodness. Third point is the practical pathways. After everything that I've done, I figured out that